seen sort of a tutorial on demystifying Moore's Law. I hope that at the end I have demystified it as opposed to made it even more mystical. We shall see. Um, let me remind you, don't forget to fill out the online session evaluation form. There's an opportunity to win valuable prizes, and I will undoubtedly fill it out to see if I can win one too. Uh, what I want to talk about today is I'm going to talk a little bit about basic scaling, then I'm going to talk quite a bit about electrostatics. Electrostatics is one of my favorite subjects. So I'm going to talk about planar devices and trigate devices, and then some more advanced devices, such as wires and dots. And then I'll talk a little bit about mobility, which is another one of my favorite subjects, and then talk about some practical real-world issues, uh, particularly parasitics, resistance, and capacitance. So let me begin here with a 32 uh, nanometer generation microprocessor, just reminding ourselves what that looks like. And let's pretend that we somehow could zoom in on this microprocessor and kind of turn it sideways. And so this would be the metal stack in the microprocessor, starting at the metal one layer and working our way up to the top of the stack. Now, I'm a transistor person, and I'm primarily going to be talking about transistors. And one of the things that um, is very ego dampening about my part of the field is that if you actually look at the transistor itself, the transistor can hardly be seen in this picture. It's actually sitting right there, and that's the little bit that, in my mind, does all the work. All the rest of this is owned by the back end, guys. Okay, now, another challenge that we have today is that everything is becoming much more atomic scale. When I started in this business in CMOS about 15 years ago, you didn't spend a lot of time worrying about where the atoms were. Well, today you do. When I sit down with my staff and we throw up towns on the board and start arguing about them, we really are having arguments about, is this atom here, is this atom there? We're realistically having discussions about just how many dopant atoms do we have in the channel? Is it 10 or is it 12? And that's very, very different than a generation or so ago. It's also affecting how we think about our devices and our device modeling. Is that classic conventional drift diffusion modeling was a standard of the industry for some time. Now we're starting to be in a space where people can and are doing atomistic modeling, where they're keeping track of every single atom in the device and worrying about what it's doing and where it is. So the whole problem is becoming much, much more atomic scale. But now, let me step back to what I think one of the key transistor challenges is. And I think one of the key transistor challenges is that we show the same size PowerPoint foil even though the transistors themselves are getting smaller. This makes it very difficult to communicate Moore's Law to people, especially to your senior managers, because all they see are the same sizes of PowerPoints every generation. What are you guys doing there in the research lab? All the things look the same to us. So my theory is, is that we need to make these things smaller every time. So that way when we stand up in front of the senior management, they can see that indeed we are doing work. <laughs> this also has the benefit that it's really hard to see what we're doing and we keep making them smaller and smaller. Well, the other approach to this is maybe we should just make a totally different kind of transistor. So the picture is so different that our senior management figures out we really are doing something. For example, the vertical devices, where we actually convinced senior management we really did have a different transistor, and not just the PowerPoints cycled over from the previous generation. But now, let me step back. One of the things I love talking about is what I call end-of-the-world predictions. And I'm going to quote one here from Jim Meindl, and Jim may not want to talk to me after I tell them this, but in IDM plenary session, 1983, IDM is the big electron devices meeting where all the electron devices geeks get together and try to figure out each other's presentations. So Jim stood up and gave a plenary talk. And in this plenary talk, he made some predictions about the sizes of devices based on short channel properties. And he came to numbers around 200 to 400 nanometers. And that's just what I call kind of the end is near sort of a prediction. This was in 1983. Now if we actually go and look, today we can fit a 22 nanometer SRAM cell inside the dimension predicted for the gate in 1983. So this kind of is, the end of the world isn't near at all. Every time we seem to think the end of the world is near, there's some new physics that helps us get around the end of the world. Furthermore, the scaling roadmap since 1995, all of it has been shorter than the supposed gate limitations of 1980 which either proves you shouldn't listen to IADM plenary talks, or that people are just a little more pessimistic than real life turns out to be. 
Now, let me step back a bit and remind everybody about how a transistor works. In its most simple form, a transistor has a gate, which controls some sort of a switch. It has some type of a carrier, and the carriers move from one side to the other. And in conventional CMOS, you usually have holes or electrons moving back and forth. Now, there are obviously more unusual forms of devices, like spin logic devices, where spin moves back and forth. But in general, in a basic CMOS device, there's a switch, there's carriers moving back and forth, and there's channel movement controlled by this gate, and that's very important. We also worry about external resistance and external capacitance. And these are critical parasitics that drive how we think about transistor problems. Now, if we look at the way a modern planar device looks, not a 3D device for the moment, because they're even harder to draw than planar devices, but a planar device. What we have here is we have our switch, and the channel is right there. And we're, we have raised source strains here for better or external. We have rectangular contacts to allow better movement of carriers in the uh, lower part of the device area. We have a high K metal gate here. We have some sort of a spacer material in many ways to keep the gate from shorting against the source strains. And there's our switch right there and our carriers move across here. And then again, we have our parasitic resistance and parasitic capacitance. So it's the same thing as my simple picture before. We've just got a lot of more elaborate architecture around it to make it work. Now, when I like to talk about devices, I love showing this three-axis graph because it shows the direction of critical research in the area of device technology. This part of the graph is electrostatic confinement. That's a very fancy multiple syllabatic set of words that basically says how I control the, the device channel with the gate. This side is mobility, how fast I can make the carriers move. And this side here, this part of the axis, that's basically practical problems, resistance and capacitance problems. So let me talk first about planar devices. If we take a look at the planar MOS device, one of the nice things about the planar MOS device is you can do many clever things with the source strain. For example, you can put silicon germanium in it to strain it, and I'll talk more about that. Um, it's the traditional device, just like I was joking about earlier, Planar devices have been around for about 40 years, and they all pretty much look the same. It's compatible with, with a race source strain technology. You can dig a hole, you can fill it up really high, and use all that volume to help get carriers into your channel. And it's compatible with high-K metal gate for improved leakage and better performance. The problem with the planar MOS device is you have terrible short channel control. You have trouble getting the gate to control the channel at small dimensions. There's also mobility degradation problems. You have to dope the channel a lot in order to hang on to the off-state current, and that means that you have significant reductions in mobility through scattering. You have variation. The more you dope the channel, the higher the variation gets. You have a drive current limitations because you can only fit the Z that's basically the length of this device into your, your product. And with a 3D device, you can actually stuff more Z into area than just the length of the device. And there's trouble stuffing enough current into this from the source strain regions. But nonetheless, the device has served us well for 40 years. Now let me introduce you to a plot that all device geeks love to show. And those of you who are device geeks can, can go to sleep right now. The rest of you can understand the plots we show our, each other. We have the on-state current on the x-axis, the off-state current on the y-axis. And we love plotting these lines. And what the lines show us as in any given value of off-state current, we have a certain value of on-state current. And if we drop the off-state current by maybe a factor of 10, then we can see how much the on-state current reduces. Now, obviously, we want to be as far over there and as far down here as possible for the highest performance and lowest leakage. And you can see how the generations stack up. And so for benchmarking, we'll typically pick a number like 100 nanoamps, draw over, and then pick what the ion is at that, at that number, and that's our benchmark number. So let's start out in 90 nanometers. The reason I like to start out in 90 nanometers is 90 nanometers was the first technology generation after the end of classic scaling. Classic Denard style constant field scaling basically ended in 130 nanometers, and 90 nanometers was the generation sort of after the end of classic scaling. And so what happened in 90 nanometers is we had to add 
certain types of enhancers in order to compensate for the lack of traditional scaling. And what we did is add a strain. We added strain in the PMOS by digging a hole and putting in strained silicon germanium to push compressively on the channel. And we added strain on the NMOS by wrapping things in a high stress film. Think of an elastic band snapping over the, the gate. And that tensely strained the NMOS. And you can see here in my strain chart for the past five generations showing, particularly for the PMOS, the germanium concentration in the epi, that's the red gap graph here, and the resulting channel strain that we were able to achieve in the PMOS. And you notice here in my ion eye off plot, there's the 90 nanometer generation for N and for P. Now let's go to the next generation. And to go there, let me talk a little bit about the SRAM cell. In the 90 nanometer generation, we used what was called a tall SRAM bit cell. And the tall SRAM bit cell was distinguished by having the diffusion regions of the cell being very uh, curvy. The poly is here, the PMOS is up on top, the NMOS is on the bottom. And you can see there's many places for variation here where the cell curves and the poly curves over the cell and as things move around with registration, you get all sorts of variation challenges. What we did is we moved to what's called a wide bit cell. And the advantage of the wide bit cell is you've lost all those curves. Notice here we have nice straight polylines, we have nice straight diffusions, and there's not all this variation as you move the poly over the diffusion. And that was a major change in, in the 65 nanometer generation. Now if we look at the picture here of the schematic of the SRAM cell, one of the things to introduce you to is a device plot called an SNM plot. It's a static noise margin plot, often called a butterfly plot. And device people like to show it because you can show the potential performance of memory while measuring only a single cell. And so what you do is you basically uh, take a look at the node 1 versus node 2. You write a 1 followed by a write a 0. And you end up with a box. And the size and dimension of that box is your static noise margin plot. And then you can compare that for different kinds of cells. And so here's our 65 nanometer node. There's the wide bit cell. There's the 65 nanometer device. You see the problem here. It looks an awful lot like the 90 nanometer device. Um, and then here's basically our SNN cells for this generation with the wide bit cell, demonstrating how well we were able to achieve a good SNM with the cell, and also showing our 2x per generation Moore's Law scale with the SRAM. And adding to my plot of a minute ago, here's the ion on off improvement for that generation. Now, if we go up to 45 nanometers, this is the generation where we introduced high K metal gate. In this generation, we basically took the old silicon oxynitride stack and replaced it by a hafnium based high K dielectric and a metal. You have to do them both at the same time, otherwise you can't control the VT, a phenomenon known as VT penny. The other thing it does is it allows you to remove a phenomenon called polydepletion. Once you have metal in your gate, you uh, can remove this kind of depletion effect that occurs in a polysilicon gate, and that allows for significantly better performance. So the 45 nanometer generation was basically the generation we introduced high K, and it was the generation that allowed us to return to the traditional 0.7x Moore's Law scale on gate dielectrics. Notice that we lost it in 65 nanometers. We had one generation where we had no Moore's Law scale and we got it back again. The reason high K is very special is because high K provides a larger barrier for quantum mechanical tunneling. What happens in a gate dielectric is that you can actually tunnel your carriers from one side of the gate dielectric to the other. And that's a physical thing. It's the width of the dielectric is what determines the tunneling. If I have a dielectric of a certain electrical thickness, if I can increase the K of that dielectric, I can keep the same electrical thickness and make it physically wider, which drops the amount of tunneling. And that's what you see here. Here's a silicon oxynitride film. And here's a high K film. And we have a dramatic decrease in the tunneling. There's also some subtleties here. It turns out as you increase the gate voltage, you can actually tunnel through the very tip of the bind layer of a high K film. And that's why right up here is a little bit poor performance than right down here. You're about two orders of magnitude here, 
um, and at about three orders of magnitude in this region. And that's because you tunnel through the silicon oxynitrite part of the dielectric. And then adding yet another plot here for 45 nanometers. Notice how big a jump we got on the PMOS in 45 nanometers. What happened here was very special. When we made the metal gates, we make a dummy gate and we pull out the poly. We just remove it and replace it with metal. When we do that, we enhance the strain. It's kind of like if you're squeezing something and you pull it out, you're squeezing it better. The same thing works in transistors. And so we enhance the PMOS strain by doing this replacement gate process, and we got even better performance than you would usually expect. And then last but certainly not least, here is 32 nanometers. Um, in this generation, we really worked on the problem of pitch scaling. With the loss of classic Denard scaling, one of the things we started to struggle with is as you make the dimension smaller, not only does the performance degrade and have to be compensated, but you have more and more trouble putting things like your strain sources in the very small source drain regions. And so maintaining improvement as you scale pitch becomes very difficult. And one of the things that the 32 nanometer node demonstrated was continuing improvement in drive current even though the pitch was declining. And that was a very significant uh, advancement for that technology. And here's the last line in the graph showing the four generational improvement there on plane. Now, one thing to emphasize here, back to demystifying Moore's Law, what is Moore's Law really? Well, Moore's Law really, other than a t-shirt, Moore's Law is being able to decrease the area of the circuit by a factor of two every generation. That fundamentally is what we're talking about because it's a cost reduction. The best way to reduce cost is just to reduce the size of something so you can put a lot more of them on the same chip. And so here for the past five generations, you can see the SRAM. Remember that tall bit I talked about? The wide bit, a wide bit with double patterning, a better wide bit with double patterning, and then the 22 nanometer generation here, which has, of course, the 3D device, showing the 2x decrease in bit cell area every generation. OK, but now let me go back to the planar MOS device. I spent the last few minutes talking about that, showing kind of a history of working through the planar MOS devices. Why don't we build planar MOS devices anymore? Well, the fundamental problem is short channel control. You can't make them any smaller without losing control of your channel and having very, very high eye-off. So 22 nanometers was basically the end of planar scaling for high-performance devices. And we introduced all the thin devices. Now, you folks have seen this, of course. This is the April 25th release of the Trigate device. Just to remind you what you're looking at, this is the poly here. That's the diffusion. So carriers go like that. They go over there. Here again is the poly. This is the diffusion. Now it's a fin. The carriers go across here. And I've got lots of fins and potentially lots of poly lines covering them. Another way to think about this device, and typically I use a napkin for this if I have one, is you take a regular device and you fold it vertically. That's all you're really doing. You're just taking the device and you're squishing the device vertically. And so from the standpoint of the carriers, any particular carrier of the device is doing pretty much what it did before. It's going from this side of the device to that side of the device. But now you've stuffed the, the, what used to be the width dimension vertical. And that has benefits not only on your short channel control, because now you can wrap the gate all around this thing. It also has benefits on scaling, because you can stuff more W in a given footprint area and get some benefits that way. And so, of course, the other thing you can do, there's nobody who said you could only have one fin in the device. You can have multiple fins lined up and have a gate across all the fins at once. Now, there's some nomenclature on this. As you walk down the hall, you'll pe hear people talk about fin fets and tri gates and a variety of other devices, all of which kind of sound like they might be related. Well, they are. And here's kind of a decoder ring for the different types of devices. A FinFET device, for example, the Berkeley FinFET device, is a double gate device where the top channel is blocked. So you have a gate here and a gate there, and that's a FinFET. A tri-gate device, for example, the Intel device, has three gates. The top is not blocked. A pi-gate device, which people sometimes talk about, has a recess that cuts down a bit so the gate actually goes below the device and you get some help from the fields going underneath the device that helps the short channel control a bit. An omega effect device is actually notched. 
So it's the same idea as this, except they notch underneath to get a little better gate control gap. And then a gate all around device is, logically enough, gate all around. And that has the best short channel control of anything. So if we take a look at the tri-gate device, the benefits of the tri-gate device, the first and most important benefit is you have a very thin device here with a gate on each side, a little gate on the top for the tri-gate, and you just have superb short channel control in this device. You have better short channel control than, for example, in a very thin planar device because you basically have a gate on each side. And by having a gate on each side, you can actually make this physically a little bit larger to get yourself off the quantum and scattering limits. So it has some benefit over things like ultra-thin body devices. You can put these things on bulk. And so I is more expensive than bulk. And there's no reason why you can't put a tri-gate on bulk, and that's what we do. You can do this vertical Z-scale thing. You can grow the device vertically without changing the footprint. A great benefit to Moore's Law. You have very good channel control. You have improved variation. RDF is random doping fluctuations. Its variation is a function of doping. You don't have to dope these devices as much, so you get improved variation. You can run multiple threshold voltages. There's no reason not to do that. And you have nearly ideal subthreshold slopes because both sides of the gate are tied together. You can also put racehorse strains on these, and you can unhook the gates from each other. You can run the gate on one side differently than the gate on the other side. Now, this is not of interest in logic, but the SRAM guys look at this with interest for potential lower VCC men. Now, let me introduce you to a plot that device folks like to look at because it'll be helpful in the next part of the class. Device folks like to plot DG versus ID, where the saturation voltage is that corner of the plot. What's called ID LAN is right up here. It's the 50 millivolt VDS as opposed to the 1 volt VDS. And the subthreshold slope is the slope of the high VDS curve, and I off is the intercept there with zero. And some things to look at in these plots is the closer these curves are to each other, the lower the dipple, the better the short channel properties, and the steeper that slope, the better the uh, short channel properties, the better the control. And of course, the higher that number is, the happier everybody is, especially if that number is high and that number is low. And so to think about this, when we look at a short channel device, this would be a very good long channel device. Now watch what happens to this plot if we start to make the device short. These things separate from each other, the two potential lines separate, and the slope gets worse. And that's basically one way you can tell just by looking at these graphs if the device has good short channel control or not. So let's start out here, um, more 20 years ago, with the first use of a thin device. Now, Intel has never claimed we invented thin devices. In fact, um, Hisamoto is probably the earliest reference we found, but there may be ones earlier than that. And he basically said, look, hey guys, if you make a device in this form, you can get an improved subthreshold slope, and here he plotted it as a function of the width of the device, and showed that indeed putting a gate on each side of the device actually is beneficial. And sometime later, of course, there's the work out of Berkeley, and the work out of Berkeley on FinFEX must definitely be recognized in this, in this space, because they've done some excellent work over the years. This is the 1999 paper. It happens to be the first one that called these things FinFEX. In this paper, they built the device, and they showed a very nice graph here of the thin width and the subthreshold swing, showing the improvement in the subthreshold swing as the thin width gets smaller. Basically, as you make the thin skinnier, you get more and more gate control. It's intuitively reasonable, and plus the data showed it works. For our position in here in 2002, Robert Chow presented a nice paper at ISSDM. Um, one of the keys of this paper, though, is the very nice pictures he has, which is one of the reasons we like to show it. And here you see very good short channel properties of the device. Look at how close the curves are to each other. Um, you see very good drive current. Look at the size of that number. And quite good subthreshold slope. So it was a very nice demonstration of what was called a tri-gate device. Because unlike the Berkeley devices, these things had gates on all three sides. And then the Jack Cavalero's paper at IDM 2006. Uh, this paper showed many of the features of the fully achieved architecture. It showed the fin itself. It showed putting epi on the fin with a gray source drain. It showed a gate on the fin and so on, and showed excellent performance here. If you go across, about 1.4 milliamps per micron, which is very, very good performance. And here, of course, is the IDVG graph. Again, respectable self-threshold slope, not as good dipple as one would like, 
Uh, this device was more optimized for power than for dimming. Now, let's talk a little bit about why these subthreshold properties are so important. And I'm going to illustrate this by taking a planar graph here. There's my on current, there's my off current. My subthreshold, my vo uh, threshold voltage, my turnoff voltage is around there. You can approximate that by drawing two lines here and just kind of picking the inflection point. Now, if I have a device that has better short channel properties, what happens is I get a steeper subthreshold slope. And I can use that either by improving my eye off or by potentially improving my VT, or a little bit of both. You can improve your eye off some, improve your VT some, depending on how you want to balance it. The other thing this does is because VG minus VT is a very important part of drive current, the lower my operating voltage is, the niftier these things look. So if I have a regular planar device and I were to build a 22 nanometer planar device, the two curves just lie right next to each other. But when you build a device with better short channel control, such as a fin fed or tri device, what happens is you get substantially more improvement at lower operating voltage because the threshold voltage is dropped and you get a VG minus VT improvement. Okay, so now let's step back from history and the present and let's put on our binoculars to see what's going to be in the future. And we certainly can ask ourselves if some of the places I'm going to go are science fiction or not. One of the most interesting devices to look at is a wire or quantum dot device. Because remember, the FinFET got its improvement by taking a device that was confined on only one side and confining it on three sides. Well, the logical question to ask is, what if you can find it on all four sides? What if you wrap the gate completely around it? Uh, what happens? Can we get some benefit? And these devices are often portrayed something like this, where you get a high packing density by doing a bunch of vertical wires. You connect the wires together so you can have like a common source solution. And what it does do for you is it certainly further improves the short channel effects, gives you exceptional channel control, improved variation, nearly ideal subthreshold slope, and a nice dense architecture. The problem is these things are hard to build. First thing you gotta do is figure out how to build wires and dots that look like that and yield. You have stability issues. They fall over. Uh, they fall into each other. You have mobility problems. We're not talking about very big wires here. These things are five nanometers, 50 angstroms, a countable number of atoms. You throw a carrier down them and it bounces off the side. If it's not perfectly smooth, it bounces a lot. You have gate conformality issues. You have to wrap a gate all the way around these things everywhere. You have our external issues because something 50 angstroms in diameter is not easy to feed current into. There's strain issues. We strain our devices very strongly today. We have to somehow strain in this architecture. And you have the classic challenges of how to make these things. And how would you make something this small and have everything work and yield? You have pattern and fidelity issues. And last but not least, you have a large number of variation challenges. Um, it turns out that people have been working on these devices almost as long as FinFETs, but they're substantially harder to, to build. And you can see some of the earlier work. Uh, here's an example from Takedo in 1988, showing the gate all around device and showing some of the performance improvement. And here's a much more recent example with some phenomenal pictures. This one shows the, the vertical nano wires. Here's the gate, here's the drain. And this very nicely shows the improvement in subthreshold slope as you drop the diameter of these things. And look at that fabulous IDVG. So there's certainly something here for the future, but it's not going to be easy. Now, I want to go up this axis a little bit because this axis is very, very powerful in modern devices. And this is a graph I love to show. It shows the drive current, it shows the gate pitch, and it shows the fraction by color of all the things we add to devices. So for example, in uh, 90 nanometer, we add strain. And you can see we've had strain in every generation, and the strain has improved in every generation. Strain is a huge knob in our processes. Also here you can see the high K metal gate, some other types of things that we don't talk about, and then the classic scale. Now we have to not talk about some things, keep our secrets here. But look at that strain. This is very exciting, because when we first put it in, we thought we'd get a one generation improvement out of it. It basically cranks up every time. But the other thing about strain that's very important is this graph also proves that if you take the strain out, you've got a problem. So anything that competes with a classic strain uh, CMOS device 
has got to be better than this actually very good, highly strained solution, and that's not easy. And we strain in a lot of ways. I already talked about this business of digging a deep hole and filling it with silicon germanium. You can also do this on ant. You can dig a deep hole and fill it with silicon carbide and strain the other direction for animals. You can, uh, I talked about wrapping a rubber band around the device. I showed here some work. You can actually wrap a rubber band around the device, so to speak, cut off the top and still have it work for strain, a solution that works with replacement gate processes. You can do this almost magical perpetual motion stunt where you implant something into the gate, you wrap it with something like silicon nitride, you cook it, it strains the channel, you take the material out, you put some new dummy material in, you implant it, you wrap something around it, you heat it, you strain it some more, and you can keep going. And that's called stress memorization, and I showed here an example of a paper where they did it three times in a row. And then I've already talked about this, is in a replacement gate process, if you've already strained your channel and you pop out the gauge, you get an enhancement of the strain. It's one of the few techniques that works for both NMP. Another thing you can do, which is you know, very exciting, is you can change the orientation of the silicon you have. For example, modern silicon has a 100 surface, but you can also use something with a 110 surface. And at first glance, this looks like a fabulous way to get improved mobility. However, there's a catch in this. If I show a plot here of stress versus mobility, and I look first at the 100 surface, what happens here is I have relatively low mobility at no stress. But as I stress the surface, my equipotential diagram in my valence band starts to look kind of like a hockey puck. Hockey pucks are good. Hockey pucks have really good mobility in the transport direction and really good density of states. We like hockey pucks. Look at the other one. The other one starts out high, looks really super. But when I compress it, I get these things that look like kayaks on their nose. Those aren't nearly as good. And so what happens is, is even though the 110 surface looks better at low stress, it looks worse at high stress. And then you can get into a big debate about where that crossover point is. One of our colleagues, Scott Thompson at IDM 2006, showed one graph of this crossover point. He actually has a series of these, and I keep threatening him that I will make a plot of his crossover point graphs versus year. This is our most recent one, where you can see we have the crossover point out, point out at about 3 gigapascals. scales. What this means is a normal device, I showed earlier that some of our historic devices had about 2 gigapascals. So we're still sitting in the range here where 110 might potentially be interesting. So it's one question we look at. Now, let me talk about Germanium. Germanium is a wonderful semiconductor. Germanium, in fact, was the world's first transistor back in 1947. And some of the reason that Intel as a company exists is actually because of a conflict between Shockley and some of the original founders of Intel over whether germanium or silicon would be the right long-term transistor material. Well, we know how that played out. However, germanium is back on the table again. And you've got to ask, why after 40-some years are we looking at germanium again? I mean, it didn't work then. Why is it going to magically work now? Well, part of the reason has to do with high K-metal gate. The moment high K-metal gate appeared, people went back and said, hey, wait a minute. We might be able to do germanium. Because one of the biggest challenges with germanium was the challenge that germanium has a really crappy native oxide. GDO uh, is hydroscopic. It's volatile. If you look at it too hard, it jumps off the wafer. Silicon dioxide is wonderful, fabulous stuff. It's a beautiful dielectric that sits on a well-behaved semiconductor that can be fabricated in huge quantities. You know, the silicon dioxide silicon system is pretty hard to get around. And so when HiK first came out, people said, fabulous, we can get around this germanium oxide problem by putting HiK on the germanium. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite so easy. HiK, as I mentioned before, is a bilayer. When you put HiK on silicon, you get a little thin layer of silicon oxynitrite. It's really thin, a couple of angstroms. And then you get high key on top of that. And that works fabulously well because when you optimize the system, you end up optimizing that silicon oxynitride layer just like you did an old style dielectric, and then you get the benefit of the high K. Life is good. You try this on germanium, and you end up with a thin interface layer of guess what? GEO, the world's worst oxide. And so you've kind of still recreated the problems of the historical germanium. And that's been a major issue in getting these devices to work. But now let me show you why people even go back and bother about it. You can make a plot of mobility here, whole electron mobility, and look at the moment just at the green. That's the whole mobility. 
and mobility of PMOS device. Germania is uniquely interesting. It has the highest mobility of anything. It's not like there's a better one. And it's a reasonably well-behaved semiconductor, especially when you compare it with things like Indian Antimono. And so the interest in germanium continues because we do have more tools to deal with the dielectric problems than we've had historically. And here's the other reason people are very interested in it. If you look at the whole mobility as a function of stress, how silicon improves with stress, look at germanium's improvement with stress. So not only do you have a higher initial mobility, you have a stronger slope. And so people continue to be interested in, in germanium. And as people have shown from integration of silicon germanium both in channels and the source strain, it's a material that's pretty compatible with modern CMOS uh, technologies. Okay, so now I turn to go to science fiction again. Let's talk about three fives. Because germanium work is being done today, some manufacturers actually have silicon germanium in their channels, although they don't use it for these mobility enhancement reasons, but I think that time will come. But now we start to see people talking about 3.5. Now, when we start talking about 3.5, the first thing we have to remember is that a 3.5 substrate, I think about as big as they come these days are 4 inches compared to discussions on 450 millimeter for silicon. And they're not as mechanically robust as a silicon substrate. So we are unlikely to ever see anybody running 3.5 materials as a base material. However, the question of 3.5s in a channel of the CMOS device has not been closed. There's some very interesting work going on in that area. But let's talk a little bit about why people would even bother. Well, this is my same plot of a minute ago, but here's the electron mobility. And notice <coughs> indium phosphide, gallium arsine, indium antimonide all have these stunning electron mobilities. Three fives look really, really interesting for an NMOS material. As I mentioned, germanium looks interesting for a PMOS material. Over here, a plot called by device folks, a map of the world, which has lattice constant on the x-axis and band gap energy on the y-axis, shows one of the problems with 3.5s in that they tend to reside with lattice constants a long, long way away from silicon. So does germanium, but germanium is close enough that you can you know, bridge across, especially if you run some silicon germanium uh, that's lattice matched to silicon, you can strain it and get it to get in there. But some of these materials are so far lattice mismatched, it's extremely hard to grow them on silicon, and that's a very key problem. Um, and I show the picture here of that. What happens here is when you draw, grow these two wildly lattice mismatched materials, one on top of the other, you get all sorts of defects and stacking faults. And of course, you need to have very low levels of defects in a semiconductor in order to have reasonable yield. So this is a very frightening characteristic with these materials. Another problem with this material, and I think in many ways the key problem, because there are some ways to get out of these problems of fabrication of the lattice mismatched materials. For example, you can grow very, very thin layers and make a super lattice. You can grow them in very small places on the semiconductor, make little bitty islands that are too small to dislocate. But there are two fundamental problems that are very hard to get around. The first problem is narrow band gap. If you look at these materials, with the exception of gallium arsenide, most of them tend to reside in band gaps, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. That's a problem because you get a phenomenon called band-to-band -band tunneling when you have a relatively narrow band gap. That's the bad news. The good news is typically you can run a product at roughly the voltage equal to the band gap. And as our products are running ever lower voltages, you can operate with ever lower band gaps. So this is, I think, a nuisance, not a fundamental problem. But it is definitely a nuisance. This one is the big problem. Just like with germanium materials, it is very difficult to put an oxide on a 3.5 material and have decent mobility and decent reliability. I mean, if germanium is hard, 3.5 materials are even harder yet because you're working on materials that just like germanium oxide make very, very poor oxides. And so there's a lot of very interesting research work going on right now in putting high K type dielectrics on 3.5 materials that have been grown in clever ways on silicon to try to get around some of these problems. Okay, now, I'm going to get practical. I've spent the last 30 minutes or so talking about different new kinds of devices, some in existence today, some much more theoretical. Now I want to talk about some of the things that really limit device scaling. And one of the biggest ones is the parasitic zero, resistance and capacitance. 
And device guys will just go out to lunch and spend hours talking about these problems, by the way. We don't spend a lot of time talking about sophisticated electrostatics. We spend an awful lot of time talking about resistance. If we look at a planar device here, and I'm using a planar as an example because it's just easier to draw, but all these things apply to trigates, spin fets, wires, everything. Here's where the action actually occurs, right there on the channel. But you have to get the carriers out through this, which is called a tip or a source drain extension. You have to get them through the epi. You have to get them out through the psilocyte and up into the contact. And there's a great long string of resistors there. And all of them are difficult. This resistor here is difficult because you have to make a very shallow, very highly doped film. This resistor is difficult because this epi has a lot of functions in life, for example, strain, and resistance is often not top of the list. This is difficult because the psilocyte that you put on your epifilm may be a psilocyte whose energy barrier is not in the right place for the type of carriers you're putting through here because you need a psilocyte that um, reacts properly with your epi, but you also need a energy height that's sort of near the bandage for the carriers, and often you don't get those things at the same time. And then you need a contact, and there's no room. And so sometimes the contact itself is stuffed in such a small space that you can't get any current through it. Now there's a lot of things people can do. For example, on chips, one of the things we've seen in recent years is the use of very sophisticated implant technologies where people are throwing molecules at wafers instead of atoms and doing very clever things with anneals where they're annealing with extremely short pulses to try to get atoms in here as narrow and small a region with as high conductivity as they can. There's a bunch of stunts that you can pull where you can put more dopant atoms in a film than basic physics allows by making the film a little bit non-equilibrium. So lots of interesting work in that area. For the Schottky barrier height problem, the psilocyte problem, the difficulty here is that theoretically this should be easy. If I look at Schottky barrier heights here, look at my red lines in the plot. If I want a PMOS device, I want things over here, like iridium, platinum, osmium. They aren't cheap, but they do work. And over here, I want things like the rare earths, erbium, and things like that. Looks like it's an easy problem. I just go spend the money and put it on. The problem is when you actually build these things, it doesn't work. You end up pinning this uh, band right about in the middle. And it's actually extremely difficult to make these materials behave correctly for resistance when you lay them on top of the epi and make a psilocyte. And it's a region of much, much work right now where you can do things like implant or alloy to try to make a better barrier there. And then the contact itself, well, nobody said you had to use tungsten. You could use copper or silver or some of the more conductive materials. The problem here is copper is kind of an obvious choice. Let's go put copper in this and solve all our problems. Copper can escape in the front end and become a reliability issue. So you say, okay, cool, we can solve that problem. We'll put a little thin boundary here. Well, in order to keep the copper from escaping, you need a relatively thick thin boundary. The characteristic of that thin boundary is it tends to be very resistive. And you end up in this problem where at the end of the day, after you've made a thick enough boundary here to keep the copper from escaping, your resistance is actually worse, not better. That's no fun, by the way. And last but not least, uh, capacitance. I can talk about capacitance all afternoon and put everybody to sleep. But let me talk a little bit about capacitance historically. Historically, we worried about the channel capacitance, that's the MOS capacitance where the carriers are, about the uh, capacitance here at the tip region, and about the junction capacitances. These are the capacitances of these source train regions back to the device. Junction capacitance, people are stopping worrying about because we haven't got any junction anymore. The areas are getting so small. Tips are getting smaller. These capacitors are dropping. But there's a whole new type of capacitance that's showing up, which is all the architecture now is getting so tight that capacitances of contacts to the gates across the spacer are becoming very, very important. Three or four generations ago, nobody cared. The spaces were so big. But now you have a contact laying against your spacer, laying against your gate, and the cap across the gate to that contact is becoming very significant. And so more and more of these external parasitic caps of the surrounding environment are becoming as big a deal as some of the, the historic device caps. And here are some examples of things you can do. One thing that keeps cycling back is the idea of why do we need a spacer at all? Let's just get rid of the spacer, sort of an IBM air gap in the front end. That's easier to say than to do. A more conventional solution is just to make a very low case spacer. So let me conclude here. Um, I was asked a question in the fellows forum um, 
presentations yesterday evening about how many generations ahead it is till the end of Moore's Law. And I gave the answer, which I believe, by the way, that it's a moving target. It's always two generations from wherever we happen to be. And I continue to believe that. We, it's kind of a limit of visibility. It's a limit of the headlights. We see ahead of us about a decade, and that's about as far ahead as we've ever seen at any point in doing silicon technology. So I'm in close here with two of my favorite slides. My first slide is more and more. And for those of you who are familiar with more and more, usually the slide is done with different sizes of devices. And then the second one is more than more. This is usually done with different pictures of devices. But I found that every time anybody comes to Intel, they have to have their picture taken with a wafer. That's just one of the requirements. Okay, so I told you about the evaluation form. Uh, a few minutes here for question and answer. <laughs>